Hello, good evening. Welcome to Manifesting Healing Monday. I am Dr. Kimani, licensed clinical psychologist. We are here again to talk about black women and workplace bullying. We've been talking about black women and workplace bullying um, all of November, all of October, um, because it's such a pervasive issue. I see people joining now. Hello, Chiquita. Hello, Stephanie. Good that you guys have joined us. Um, so today we're actually having a double dose because we um, had a conversation earlier today with a psychologist, a clinical psychologist in uh, the UK. And today, uh, this evening, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Rochelle Robinson, who is a school psychologist in New York. So we wanted to um, have an experience of learning about the experiences of workplace bullying across the globe, right? And so we have talked quite a bit in terms of experiences of workplace bullying in America, um, but also learning that there's so many commonalities for workplace bullying for Black women in England as well, okay? So our guest has joined us. Um, Dr. Rochelle Robinson, and we will be joining her in to our conversation soon um, when she sends in a request. As I've mentioned on the other IG Lives on this topic, many um, Black women have experienced what we're talking about, it to raise awareness um, so that Black women know that we're not alone in this experience. And hello, Dr. Robinson. Hey. Good evening. Thank you for joining me. I was just doing an intro um, in terms of, you know, why we're having this conversation that Black women have very high rates of experience in workplace bullying. And it's so serious because, you know, just think about the impact that it has on us physically, you know, psychologically, and also spiritually, right? And I came across an article recently, and they talked about the heart attack heart attack rates for black women between the ages of, I think, like 35 and 54, the rates are, are increasing, right? And the rates for other groups are decreasing, and they couldn't understand why. But what they're saying is it's a lot of environmental factors, so like job stress, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to welcome our guest, Dr. Rochelle Robinson. I just want to say that I met Dr. Robinson. We are both members of the Dope Therapist Academy and also Elite Mastermind uh, Coaching with Dr. TK, um, who really teaches us about ways to um, really stand in our, our truth and our power and really serve our communities um, in the best ways possible. So um, I want to welcome you, Dr. Robinson. If you could just briefly introduce yourself and then we'll get started in the dialogue. Sure. I am a, a New York State licensed school psychologist. I have worked in schools for the, for the last 13 years. And in September, I decided to um, venture out and go into private uh, practice. So I am currently doing that now. I work with um, teenagers. I also teach at a local university. And I am a new author. So I've uh, published a um, journal specifically for um, teenagers. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So. Yes, 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 so exciting, so exciting. So again, thank you for joining. And I know we had talked before about you've been watching the series. And, you know, we talked about your own experiences of workplace bullying. So I'm wondering if you could share with the listeners one experience of workplace bullying that you've had. Um, and how it impacted you? I would say that throughout my career, I've definitely had different um, situations where I was bullied. And at the time, I wasn't sure. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things was I was at what I considered to be my um, dream job. And, you know, everyone said, you know, as a uh, first year school psych, like you have to be tight. It's just mm -hmm. happening. You know, so mm -hmm. I, that was naturally, you know, like what would happen. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very sophisticated and that no one was, you know, coming at me saying, you're doing this wrong or, 
you know, mm -hmm. what, um, it was lack of um, support. Mm. So where the psychologist before me had a part-time um, psychologist there to assist and interns, when I was hired, I was told that I was going to have that. And then when I got there, everything was taken away. So Wow. No help. It was like sink or swim. <laughs> yeah. And uh -huh. people are just like, but, you, um, but you're new. Like, you have to prove that you can handle this. You have to prove that you can do all of this work. Like, you have to uh, defy the odds. Not knowing that there literally was no way to make that happen and mm. uh, my assistant principal was so helpful you know mm. there for me and um some of the other um workers there but you know it would be like okay this is what you have to do like mm -hmm. do this, this and this and then once i mastered that mm -hmm. another level like what well, you have to you know yeah it's like impossible it's impossible to ever get caught up there's no way. There was no yeah. way. Yeah. Oh, I really saw that. Um, I really saw. Um, so in our field, uh, the majority of the people who who are in our field are white women. And mm -hmm. I definitely had um, people who could have helped and who mm. had back and said, oh, you know, well, you'll get it. Or like you said, like they kind of see you um, sing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I have all of this um, support here, but I'm not going to, like, help out. Like, you'll figure it out. Hmm. Like, uh, I see you're drowning and, and nobody's throwing you a, a life jacket or anything. Okay. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but mm -hmm. you can do it. You're strong. You know how to do hmm. it. So I would say that it took me a while to realize that that was what was happening because mm -hmm. I just thought had to prove what I could do, you know? So I thought that it was normal, right. you know, until it comes out that there was another Black woman who was in our um, district experiencing the same thing. And we were the mm. only two people experiencing it out of everybody new. Wow. So, yeah, that was mm -hmm. really, like, once I realized what was happening, I was like, oh, this is, not going to work. Right. And and Dr. Robinson, that sense of like, as a black woman, we always have to prove ourselves mm -hmm. in any new environment. Everywhere we go, we always have to prove ourselves. And here we go again, you're coming into your dream job, right? And you have to prove yourself again. And you came in, it's kind of like a bamboozle move, right? So you came in with the perception or the, the promise that you would have support and you get there, and then it's like a setup for failure, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You know, and we're just, you know, like, we're always just kind of taught, like, it's not about race. It's not about race. Yeah. Try to keep yeah. it's not about race. And, and then it's like, but it kind of feels like it's about race. <laughs> It, what absolutely is right <laughs> right and that's what's so insidious about racism is that it makes you question yourself like did i do something wrong or do i have the credentials or why are people treating me this way but it's, it's racism it's just straight out racism yes and the fact that you saw another black woman having a similar experience validated that as well yeah. right Yes, yes, yes. And I see a comment in the chat. Um, you know, we go through so much. You went through so much, Dr. Robinson, to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. And to still have to always prove and prove and prove. It's exhausting. So can you share with the listeners, when did you realize, number one, that it was workplace bullying? And number two, what impact did it have on you? Um, I would say that I realized it when there were there there were okay so we were always taught in our building from our direct supervisor that if there is an issue bring it to us we'll work mm -hmm. it together it'll be handled here mm -hmm. i knew i knew i knew that there was a problem when people started to go above him and bypass him to go all the way to the top to um 
make complaints about things that were super simple. Hmm. That the assistant principal would, would say, well, we could have handled that here. Like that mm -hmm. didn't go above. So um, that was the main thing that kind of like tip like you know like tip me off like okay something really strange is going on here it's the weird dynamic oh no yeah. uh -huh. running the show and hmm. the supervisor is not it you know like he's supposed to be the lead here but they totally um steamrolled like over him hmm. it would be annoying when it was like you guys don't even have the um degrees that i have but the power that was wielded here was, mm. was unimaginable. Wow. Wow. And yeah. how did that trickle down to you, Dr. Robinson, in terms of the power that they had and how that impacted you in the workplace? I mean, I, w I, mean, I was just asked, you know, like not to come back and, you know, to ask, you know, why, like, what was the reason? It was, oh, we're going in a different direction but a different direction that nobody could explain where it was. Right. Where are we going? Right. Yeah. And again, the assistant principal who was the direct supervisor of the psychologists, the social workers, the guidance counselors, he had no idea, you know, this decision was made. And I was told on a day that they knew that he was going to be, be out. So, wow. Oh, that this conversation was happening until he came back the next day. Mm. So you were kind of left out there just hanging. Yeah. Right? Hanging. And up until that point, did they did they even tell you they were about to go in a different direction or something was No. Did they tell you? No. And not that it's funny now, but I mean I had an observation where I had outstanding reviews. Wow. I and uh, the principal and the AP really got into a very heated d debate and argument mm -hmm. because he said, she's fine, you know. Right. Like, yes, I was new to the district. Yes. Mm -hmm. But definitely, it was such a shock to everyone. Um, and really having to be professional throughout all of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when did you find out that they were going in a different direction? So, like, and then compared to the end of the school year? So this direction change shift happened in February and our year ends in June. Ooh. So four months of not saying anything, of behaving, professionally mm. um, I actually did an amazing job with it um, and that other people had no had no idea and then on the last day when they found out like teachers were literally in my office crying because they couldn't believe that I was not gonna be there right right you know the question is always like why like well what happened mm -hmm. Nobody had an answer Wow so you're trying to take care of them, but you don't even know mm -hmm. what happened, right? And and Dr. Robinson, if you could just share with us, what were those few months like? So from February to June, what was it, that like for you? It was horrible. It was horrible. Mm. You know, you're there for the kids, you know, and it's always one of those things where you're not going to tell kids the details of... right on but right. you know for them talking about what uh the next year is going to be like and you know how mm. they can, um see me again oh knowing that i'm not gonna be there right so where even at the very end like when i did have to tell them that i was they were very upset um mm. they went off like this is um racism we know why this is happening you know, they don't want you here. So, um, so that was tough, but yeah, but the last few months, I really started to just focus on what I had to do. Mm. Um, 
set up my exit um, plan because I was like, I'm not going out like that. <laughs> right. You're not going to totally wipe me out, right? You you kind of threw me off at first, right? But I need to, I'm going to get myself together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was not, um, you know, like I was just really like, I was in my office, just minding my business, let me tie up everything so that, you know, when I do leave, you know, mm -hmm. things, or, you know, I still wanted to maintain the integrity of mm -hmm. my position. And, yeah. you know, and that was something that everybody mentioned, like, as I was leaving, you know, mm. that we had no idea, like, you carried yourself um, with so much grace throughout this experience, which it's a compliment, but it's also like, it's a heavy load to bear. Yeah, it sounds exhausting. You know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it sounds emotionally exhausting to like present yourself kind of like the flyer I have, right? So you have the mask, you're smiling like everything is okay, but behind the mask, you're, you're trying to keep it together because you're yeah. struggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. It, it, what supports did you have during that time, Dr. Robinson, as you were going through that period? The social worker in the building was another Black woman who had been for about 18, 19 years. So mm. she was my support. Um, and she was helpful, like, every day, just um, checking in, like, girl, how you doing? <laughs> The sister girl talk. The sister girl check in. Uh -huh. <laughs> so she yeah. helpful. Um, and I am a person of um, faith. So mm -hmm. I really leaned on that. And I would say that one of the interesting pieces, like even with that, is that it was a district that people in my like, hood felt like it was a good district. So mm -hmm. the idea of letting them down because I wasn't going to be back was something that I held close to. Like, oh, I can't tell mm -hmm. them that, you know, this is happening because mm -hmm. you know, it's such a wonderful place to be. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So I really did a lot of like internal work before yeah. I was there, what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. I was also very clear that I want to be bitter about the situation. Hmm. Because the way that I handled it was very different from the way that my other sister handled it. <laughs> and, and I was like, girl, I feel you. But I still need to work like someplace. So right. <laughs> I need to work someplace, right? <laughs> right. Because, uh -huh. because like where we were, you know, it was a district that wasn't in the city. It was in Nassau mm -hmm. County which has mm. its own culture. So mm. people talk and people know each other. Yes, and they do. While my sister over here is trying to do a lawsuit, she's trying to take everybody down. I'm like, sis, if I need to go to another um, district, they, <laughs> they're they not going to even interview me if they know right. a lawsuit. And I, you right. know, pretty young. So, yeah. You know, yeah. Still had a lot of time to, you know, grow, like, mm -hmm. place else. Mm -hmm. so, so, it, so you're saying that it's important to think about possible consequences, right? So you said, you know, you were angry and hurt by it, but you didn't become bitter because you knew that you have a professional uh, image to, to uphold. And so you knew that she wanted to go other places. So you didn't, you know, have that kind of spill out in the workplace, which is hard. Because yes. you're being tested all the time. So you were able to do that. But you also talked about during that time, you did a lot of inner work and you started working on, okay, what are my other options? Right. And so is that the time you started to think about private practice? Yeah. Yeah. That was the time when I started to get serious about it. I mean, the other piece was I was like, well, if y'all are going to take, take me out, then I'm taking everything that I can. So one of the, <laughs> couldn't help me the way that she should have. She happened to be my um, supervisor for my licensure hours. I made sure that she signed those papers before I left. 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you. This is my yes. thousand hours. Thank you. So I got that. You right. Know, I used <laughs> I used my um paychecks to like fund um coaching with excellent um TK. So that also just started to just she um shift the way that I was thinking of yes. are more than an employee. Yes. You really have your own business here and what do you offer and what do you really want to do? Exactly. You know? And other people not having the, the control over your destiny, right? Mm -hmm. That I can do other things that fulfill me on my own, on my own time and my own business. Yes. Absolutely. So that was huge. I said, mm -mm. I said, y'all done awaken something within me. That <laughs> right. The lion is awake, awoken, right? <laughs> exactly. And Dr. Robinson, I want to ask you something too. Is the name of your practice, is it Pivotal Psych? It's a Pivotal Point Psychological Consulting. You know, I think that we get to a pivotal point in life where yes. Is that something has got to change yes yes Stay the same yes and i just want to tell the listeners that dr robinson is an excellent dancer she is the bomb right and so when, when I, I was like oh wait like pivot like you pivot into dance you know the dance sequence so of course you always have to pivot right and what's so important is that um when we pivot we don't have to tell everybody we're pivoting Right, we can pivot in our own lane, our own time, but to know that we can pivot and that we don't get so bogged down in what happened to us, because then we get stuck in the moment, and then that moment has all that power over us, and it's not even worth it. Yeah, it's not yeah. worth it. I mean, I definitely allowed myself to feel that for a little minute, mm -hmm. and I said, "Okay, girl, like we got to get up." <laughs> But, but what was, see, I think this would be helpful for listeners, right? Because I know a lot of us get stuck, right? So for a lot of different reasons, I'm stuck because I need this job financially. I'm stuck because you're not going to run me out of here. This is my job. I went through all this to get here. Um, I'm going to stay because, you know, you're not going to run me, you know, you're not going to win this situation, right? So we get stuck, right? So, so what was that deciding moment where you were like, hold up, girl, it's not even worth it. Right, what, right. What, what was going on? Um, I think that, I mean, well, but besides the fact that I was going to leave anyway, like, I didn't have a choice. Like, I knew that the day right. was so Right. So, I'm like, all right, girl, like, you need to find a place where you can get a check September uh, 15th. So. <laughs> real talk. Real talk. <laughs> But actually, I would say in a different situation at the last school that I left, like I left on my own terms and mm -hmm. they tried to bully me. But because I was aware of how that system worked, I was able to mm -hmm. leave or it even got far. And um, I just knew that I wasn't happy. Yeah. I think that the other thing was that when I turned 40 this year, I was like, how am I going to live life? Am I going to be happy or mm -hmm. just going to stay at this place and go through, you know, just like the unnecessary stuff? Stress, the stress. And I had a principal who was um, Black and, you know, her thing was, come on, like, you have to do this. Like, you have to um, prove these people wrong and you got it and think mm. about it. but I was like this like I'm not I'm not doing it right and and it comes to a certain point yes we do care about the kids we're committed devoted to our work but there needs to be a level of self-preservation too and if we're not happy we need to pay attention to that and do something about it especially when we have the opportunity to do something different right so it's not like you're stuck there but sometimes people kind of make you feel like you're stuck there or you have an obligation to stay there if they stay there then you should stay there too it's like no i don't want to be unhappy like you are <laughs> yeah. there were literally people like at work crying like they would come to <laughs> is crying about oh no 
how the job was so tough. And in my head, I'm just like, why are you guys still here? I, I'm, 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 I am never going to come to work crying every day about the stress of the job. Because once I get right. to that point, it's got to be over. Like, it's a start. It's not, it's not for me. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dr. K just joined us. Hi, Dr. TK. Thank you for joining us. That's our business coach. Our number one coach for therapists has joined us also. Um, so I wanted to ask you too, you said that based upon that other situation, right, that you were able to recognize the signs earlier on, like, mm -mm -mm -mm, right? So that helped you say, I'm going to pivot and I'm going to make a change. And so you left. Right. Yes. So who, wh what was that deciding moment where you said, I'm out? Um, I think it was. So I work with um, teenagers. I love to work with teens. And mm. I was in a huge agency where I was with teens first. And then some of the teens um, dropped out and things like that. Mm. So I was with elementary school kids. And it was, whew, I just knew that. And I shared with the um, supervisor like several times, like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, this really isn't a good fit. You know, I know mm -hmm. there are things that are, you know, open, they have some space, like, is it possible? So I actually um, asked for transfers for two years mm -hmm. in a row and did not have to happen. Oh. Didn't happen. Wow. Um, I was able to get a um, sneak peek of the uh, seniority list of the mm -hmm. uh, psychologist. So mm -hmm. are supposed to happen based on where you land. Mm -hmm. And out of 79, like, psychologists, I was 77. So I said, oh, okay. no. <laughs> uh, that was easy. Uh-uh, I'm out. I'm yeah. Out. <laughs> right. You know, and when I left, like, the supervisor was so, like, Rochelle, but you're so great. Like, why would you want to leave? You know, like, you're doing such great work. And I said, yeah, I am, but it's very hard for me to do it. Like, I don't want to yeah. be. I've wow. Shared, you know, not the best fit. And mm -hmm. thoughts that are open and nothing has happened. So if you're not going to change, then I have to move. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And serve the population that you want to serve, right? Like Dr. TK teaches us all the time, our niche, right? Who's our niche population? So so saying, you know what? And I'm leaving. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay. I'm going to be okay, right? So Dr. Robinson, you talked about different ways you manifested healing in the process, right? And just what, what about the process of you leaving your job, right? So was there a fear level involved? You know, <laughs> and how did you manifest healing as you were transitioning out? Like, you knew I got to get out of here, right? But the fear, right? So how did you manifest that healing at that point? A lot of it was faith. Um, faith played a huge part in just taking the step and not knowing what was going to be next. Mm. But I had faith and I said, okay, God, like, you're not just going to allow me to be out here with no job and a whole doctorate degree. Like, <laughs> right, no, right. Like, a whole degree. Like, there's no way that nothing is going to come up. And yeah. I did go a few, I went probably a month or two, you know, with no leads. And a friend of mine uh, graduated from a uh, university and said, hey, you know, they're looking for a, uh, you know, professor for a uh, child psych class. Would you be interested in doing it? And I said that I would never teach. I said, I think that stuffy. Everybody is older. Never say never, right? Yeah. And then I, I <laughs> And it actually turned out to be something really amazing. And that actually healed me too. Because, wow. Because I was at a, which was so crazy. Like I'm at a school, I'm at um, St. John's 
University, which mm -hmm. is diverse, but I was teaching an honors class with students who wanted to be teachers. Somehow they wanted to work in schools and things like that. Mm -hmm. Majority, um, predominantly white class, but they wanted mm -hmm. to work in the city. So I was able to then speak about um, diversity and um, cultural um, sensitivity with yes. that before they got in the field. And honestly, I felt like being on this side, I was able to stop them from following in the paths of the people that I worked with. Yes. So hopefully you were preventing them Mm -hmm. from unknowingly or knowingly perpetuating bullying, right? So they, they were more informed going into the system. So yeah. you had a more proactive approach, right? But also, Dr. Robinson, you're talking about that when you kind of stepped out of the way, like when you stepped out of no, 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 and you were like, let me just try it, it was actually a great experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It allows you to grow. Yeah. yeah. It was something I said that I would never do. I focused on just myself and mm -hmm. who outside of this position, because so many times we um, define ourselves by what we do and what we're connected to. And yes. I, I just outside of this job, outside of working at this Mancy's um, school that everybody, mm -hmm. who am I really? Yes. That was very that took a while. Yes, yes, I yes. Realized how much like I was defined by what I did. Yes, right. So we talked about this before in terms of our work identity. Sometimes it becomes so important. It becomes central to who we are. But I think those experiences highlighted for you, no, this is not who I am. There's so many other things that I want to pursue, right? And and I just want to touch base with you about two things right quick, right? So I remember when we were talking, like, offline, you were saying um, that experience of workplace bullying at the other school, it was traumatic, right? In the sense that, you know, it was hard to even, I think you said, drive past the school yeah. or, right? Well, and so, yeah. The school is only 13 minutes away from my home. So for mm. me get to the mall or to get my nails done or whatever like I would have to drive past and I would literally take like the long way to get to where I had to go so that I didn't have to pass the um, school wow wow and I'm glad you shared that because sometimes people don't understand how serious workplace bullying is and it is a form of trauma and yeah. it does impact us. It can impact how we see ourselves. And it can impact how we see the world. It can change our, our how we function in the world, right? So you're going in a whole different direction to avoid that trigger. So that was that's so powerful that you said that. The other thing I want to follow up with you, Dr. Robinson, is, um, and we talked about this too. So, you know, in terms of when we want to take a step out in terms of pursuing things that are different, um, sometimes our parents may not necessarily understand, right? So in terms of generational differences about you get a job, you stay at that job, you retire, you get your benefits, blah, blah, blah right? So can you just share with the listeners just a little bit? Because what you said was so beautiful, right? In terms of what you did and then the reaction from your mo mother at a later point. So my mom has been a teacher for, well, she was a teacher for 33 years. She retired for well, she's been retired. I believe this is like her third year out. But she is somebody who she loved working in schools for all three wow. years. Wow. So, like, sometimes, like, you know, she had periods that were um, challenging. But overall, mm -hmm. she honestly would not change anything about her career. And she wow. Said, Everybody should love kids. <laughs> so, um, for me, going into the school system, you know, she was very excited and, you know, mm -hmm. going to work there 30 years. You're going to get a pension. That's going to be great. And, you know, like all of this stuff. And um, when I would talk about potentially leaving, you know, she would get quiet. She would hear and then be like, yeah, but, you know, that's not what you want to do because, you know, you're going to be able to retire and have all of this stuff going on, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
um, travel, but like, you know, you just have to wade in. Yeah. Not, not, not for nothing. Um, in 2011, my mom was like, <laughs> breast cancer. Wow. And I believe that it was because of work um, stress. Wow. So, example that I saw was, I'm not going to go down that path. Yes. Yes. To allow that to happen. Yes. So, even when I left, I didn't tell my mom for um, three weeks that I left my job and I was <laughs> And, uh, you know, actually there was a minister at our church who had recently retired from being a mm -hmm. um, psych. And when she found out, she flipped out. Like, there's no way. Like, we have to pray. Like, you got to get another job. We have to pray for another job. And make this happen, and I was like, "Whoa!" So, so, so I that kind of put their anxiety on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I just kind of like stopped talking about it, and just mm -hmm. I had to do, and I really became laser focused on what I needed to do mm -hmm. so be successful. Now, yeah. you know, when we go out, and when I pay for dinner, it's like, "Oh, my daughter has to practice. She's doing." <laughs> makes her own schedule she can do what she wants to do she's um first class but but it took her a long like she had to see what was going on you right. know and yes. social media so when people at church are like oh yeah like i see that she's doing this i see that you know um she has a book coming out mm -hmm. she find time to do all of this i'm like it's so funny, right? So in terms of that, that generational shift, right? So she's saying like, oh, this is possible. Oh, okay. And and I just remember Dr. Robinson when we were in Vegas at the mastermind of Dr. TK and, you know, the impact it had when your mom said she was proud of you, yeah. right? And we all want our, our mothers, our caretakers to be proud of us. And so sometimes that limits us telling them things when we wa might want to tell them things and they're not receptive, right? So we're like, ooh, I'm not going to tell them, but I want to share this with them. So I'm glad that you were able to bridge that, you know, in terms of being able to talk to her about that. Yeah, and she affirms you. She's proud. I was, I was honestly stressed about that for two years because, yeah, when wow. I was and I knew that I was going to leave. I knew a whole year before I left that I was going to go. And wow. Pleased with it, but I was setting things up so that I was set to go at the end of the year. Right. It was really just following through on what I said that I was going to do. And right. She didn't know, and I knew it was going to be a thing. Yeah. But, yeah. you know. Yeah. You can't live in fear. Yeah, you can't live in fear. And when you recognize there's other people around you that exacerbate the fear, we have to limit what we share with them, which can be hard because many times they're in our family. And also, Dr. Robinson, you're really highlighting that, you know, we have to set boundaries sometimes, you know, like we have to be true to ourselves. Like, because you're like 30 years, I can barely make it another year. What? Like, I can't sit here for 30 years. So, you know, being true to ourselves and knowing, no, that might be your truth, but it's not my truth. And I want to live happy and I want to be healthy. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, Dr. Robinson, as we're winding down, I'm wondering if you could tell us about your fabulous book. And I heard that this woman sketched the, the pictures. I was like, what? You're an artist, too? Oh, my God. Oh, so, <laughs> girl, I couldn't even do a, 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 some little paper, little figures, or, you know, stick figures. I couldn't even do that. So I'm like, you go. So <laughs> share with the listeners your book, what it's about, and how they can access it. And also, Dr. Robinson, about your other services. Okay. So my book is called Just Me and My Thoughts. It is a a motivational um, prompt journal that is for um, teenagers. And really, it came from my um, counseling sessions with um, students. You know, there's so much going on around us in um, society. And in the mm -hmm. building I was working in, 
they weren't allowed to talk about it because it was um, too political. You know, like that's a hot subject. You know, like what? Mm -hmm. Even though it's happening, let's not, let's just pretend like let's not talk about it because it's not happening. <laughs> okay. On TV, on YouTube, everything is right here. And people were afraid to talk about it. And I'm the type of person that I, and I go for the jug and the kids are like, this is what we need to talk about. So, yeah. you know, so the journal is actually uh, separated into seven um, sections and each section has five prompts. Um, the sections are um, self-love, gratitude, um, relationships, you know, like how to build um, healthy relationships with other people. Um, mm -hmm. What do you bring um, to the culture? Hashtag, mm -hmm. what goals um, do you have? What things are you really good at? What challenges um, do you have? And not just what the um, challenges, but what steps can you take so that you can overcome them? You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people talk about, oh my goodness, like everything is so bad, but what is one or like um, two things that you can do to overcome this? So right. there are prompts for that. We have lines so, um, so that they, they can write. But also I've provided space so that teens can um, draw, you know, because sometimes writing, you know, it's, it's challenging for them. Right. You know? Or it might remind them of school too, you know, or that's just not the way they express themselves. Yeah. Right. Who wants that? Yeah. <laughs> so I really enjoyed um, coming up with that. And it really started as something small. You know, it was like a little prompt and then a line. And mm -hmm. then a lot of things happening in the news. I said, mm -hmm. oh, got to add a bit more because young people aren't talking about this unless they're mm -hmm. getting Yes, yes, yes. Because they're seeing it, they're exposed to all this, but many times we don't give them the space to talk about it. So then they're going to interpret it in their own way. And that may impact them very deeply, right? Yeah. So feeling like, is this going to happen to me or somebody I love? What's going to happen for my future? So you provide that space. So the transformation that we're seeing with the journal is, so by, by, by young people working on their journal, what's the transformation that we're seeing or hopefully seeing? Right. Really, the goal is that it will motivate them to um, be, how, how, well, how can I say this, that they can be really engaged in their communities, you know, that it'll actually motivate them to like, get out of their rooms, be around yeah. people, you yeah. know, what are you doing like not only for yourself, but for someone, mm -hmm. you know, yes teenagers that are um depressed the um pandemic has just like um brought them down but this is something yes. to give a spark back to say mm. that you know like no matter where you live like um when you look at the cover i did mm -hmm. it um brownstones because if you're in the inner city like knowing what that environment can look like mm -hmm. almost seems like there is no hope Hmm. So this is like the opposite of that in that no matter where you live, if yes. you muster up the motivation to at least just think about where you can be. Yes. You know that there are um, supportive people ar um, around you who can mm -hmm. help where you want to be, that you can be. Mm -hmm. um, right. right. So it's transforming your view of the world and the community around you. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And can you tell the listeners just a bit about services that you offer and how they can contact you and how they can get the book? Okay. So um, I currently see um, teenagers and young adults, you know, they're college students. Maybe they are um, students who have graduated from high school and they're just trying to find their way and what life is. So um, you can visit my website at www pivotalpointpsych.com and I also also um, offer uh, psychological workshops for um, teenagers, parents, and school uh, districts. So a lot of the topics that some teachers may be afraid to kind of like touch on mm -hmm. be 
the outside. I'm able to come in, I do what I do, and then I leave, and then teachers can like take it from there. So mm -hmm. I enjoy um, talking about topics that can, you know, kind of be touchy. So um, yeah. justice, self care is a big topic right now. Mm -hmm. um, managing um, feelings of um, worry, mm -hmm. very big with um, teenagers. And uh, that's really what I enjoy doing. I really like connecting with um, teenagers. So as much as I am not working in a building, mm -hmm. the opportunity to go into different buildings and yes. different sets of um, students is really great. So yes. if you go to my Instagram page, Dr. Um, Pivotal Point site, you will see in my um, link tree, I do have a little tab for um, signing up for the for the email list for when the journal goes on pre-sale. So I'm awesome. definitely something that you want for your young folks. And yes. I'm something special like host some virtual meet and greets. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so we know how much there's such a need for mental health professionals who look like us, particularly to work with young people. So that's extremely valuable that you provide that service. And you're in New York, right, Rochelle? Okay. If you're in New York City, if you're in Nassau County, if you're upstate New York, I can see you. Yes. But you can provide the workshops anywhere, right? Yes. Virtually or... Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for um 2022 is open, so reach out very quickly so that yeah. you, you need me. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So, Dr. Robinson, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today, talking about your stories, ways you've manifested healing, the resources you have available. I'm just so grateful that you took the time to be here right. with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just want to tell the listeners that today is supposed to be the last day in terms of me having special guests come in. Um, but we're going to have a bonus next Monday, right? So next Monday is going to be a celebration, you know, of ways that all of us have been manifesting healing in relation to workplace bullying, because we have to recognize we go through a lot, but we're still standing right? And we're rising. And so how do we celebrate that rising? So we're going to have a celebration next week. And we're going to have some listeners who've joined in, who are going to pop in to talk about what this experience has been like. And then we're going to have some of our guests and hopefully Dr. Robinson, you're able to jump in too, to share what this experience was like in terms of sharing your healing journey as well. Okay, so I also want to say that all episodes of the Black Women and Manifesting Healing with Workplace Bullying, all episodes are available on my YouTube channel, which is Lifting As We Climb Consulting Wellness Services. Um, again, Dr. Robinson, thank you so much. We can't wait to see that workbook. And, um, you know, I just wish everyone well. Happy Thanksgiving, you know, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>